Aloha, my kako. Mahalo for joining us this evening. The organization coordinating the stream, Huli Pack, was birthed from a shared drive to work our system by seeking Aina based equity focused leadership for our Hawaii Island community. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to circle back to our roots and instill real change in our community from Kona to Ka'u, from Hilo to Havi. The time is now to hui the system. Conducting our interviews tonight are Claire Mason and Dominique Pena. Thank you both for joining us. And I'd like to welcome council member Heather Kimball. Um, Heather, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Kimball. I'm currently the Hawaii County Council member for District 1, which is the Hamukua area. Um, it's been a wonderful privilege to serve. I'm in my first term and um, I sit as chair of the Government Operations, Relations and Economic Development Committee. I'm the vice chair of the Finance Committee, uh, the Money Committee, and I'm the vice chair of the Climate Change and Resilience Committee. Uh, in addition to serving on those committees for the, the council, I am the Hawaii County representative to the State Association of Counties and um, participate there as one of the executive board members, um, as well as uh, part of the Resilience County, Resilient Counties um, Advisory Board for the National Association of Counties. Um, my background, I'm a mom, I've got four kids. Um, we've been talking, we were talking about that before we started the session. Um, I'm a scientist by training, and um, I, it's a long story how I went from science to politics, but um, I'm, I'm grateful every day to have the opportunity to be in this position that I'm in and help, you know, make our community and, uh, and our island a, a wonderful place to live. Thanks for the invitation to interview tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Kick it off with Claire. Um, so, yeah, just... Uh, I guess prior to working in the council, we just want to know in what ways you've advocated for our Hawaii Island community, um, whether through science or other means, um, <laughs> and what community projects you've worked on in the past. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I've had a lot of different interests uh, in, in terms of advocacy in the past. Um, you know, my, my scientific background most recently is um, in climate change adaptation and mitigation specifically around how we better communicate the science of climate change and the efforts needed to do mitigation um, to decision makers because they are complex ideas and um, they can go awry if they're not clearly explained. And it's also kind of a long-term problem. So in order to create that sense of urgency that need to act, um, you really have to communicate in an effective way. And so my role, um, I was a consultant and I served as what I, I like to call it a translator, uh, a translator between the scientific information, the data, and those people that are in policy making um, positions. So that's one, one area that I um, advocate. I also um, care a lot about women's issues and equity with respect to um, you know, access to childcare, equal pay, um, freedom from domestic violence. And so I was an uh, active member of the Zonta Club of Hilo, and I served as their advocacy chair. And we sponsored a number of bills at the state legislature. So I was involved in advocating on behalf of those pieces of legislation um, at the state legislature, as well as building awareness in our own community around, like I said, specific issues of income equality, um, domestic violence, um, and just capacity building for women in leadership, um, which is another area that, that I was involved in and advocating for as part of the Women's March. Um, you know, I think the best way as women that we can lift each other up is, is tell people, get people to run for office, especially when young women like you folks here on the call today, you know, hopefully someday this is something you'll consider doing. Um, it's important to be part of that process. And, um, you know, I, I personally have, supported many other women running for office, either financially or with advice or, um, you know, just moral support. Uh, I think we need to work together to, to lift each other up and to ampli amplify each other's voices. Um, so those are a couple of areas. Um, in addition to advocating for, for climate change and women's issues, um, I also served as chair of the Democratic Party for Hawaii County. Um, that was a, a great privilege. And of course, uh, it was right before the election of our president, Joe Biden. So I got to be involved in doing the first 
um, ranked choice voting for our presidential nominee for uh, the Democratic Party for Hawaii. And what a wonderful process. I really do hope that our state um, begins to use ranked choice voting for all our elective processes. I think it's a much better way to get very high quality candidates. So that, that's just a few of the things. Um, for those of um, yeah. our audience who are not aware of ranked choice voting process, could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So instead of just choosing um, one candidate um, in on a ballot, you rank the the your choices. You know, one, two, three. Um, your your top choices. And what what they find when when rank choice voting is in play is that people are more likely to vote their value candidate in their first vote and their safe candidate in their second vote. When you only get one choice, you're you're making the calculation: what is the likelihood that this candidate will actually win? And so you might not vote your value candidate because you might not think they have the capacity to win. And um, the other thing that it does is that it impacts the quality of the debate. So if you have three candidates and they know that maybe they can, they're not your first choice, but they could be your second choice and that might get them through, um, you have better interactions among candidates. And we saw that they have ranked choice voting in Maine. It was really interesting to watch some of their campaigns that the candidates actually campaign together and said, well, if I'm not your first choice, this is a good second choice. And um, in this day of really um, aggressive and toxic political civil discourse, uh, I, I really think that that's a, 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 a added benefit to, to doing ranked choice voting. Awesome. Yeah. Tommy, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you already mentioned a few topics in your last response, but what was it initially that inspired you to run in, in office, especially coming from a scientific background, jumping into politics? Yeah, that is not as usual. <laughs> no, it's not. And, um, and and it's unfortunate. I think I think my scientific colleagues would actually find uh, a political career more rewarding than maybe it looks like from the outside. But um, let me let me just start by saying I grew up. Um, my parents were both teachers, and um, I, I just was instilled with a value that um, you just try to give back, right? You whatever skills you have, whatever resources you have, uh, a life of service is is a life of value. Like that that's how you make your life meaningful. And so I've always had this service-oriented mindset. Um, the way I went from science to politics, though, was uh, I started working, as I said, doing consulting um, through the, the Tropical Conservation um, Biology and Environmental Science Program through UH, um, helping uh, environmental organizations determine how best to do land management. So we would use various data sets looking at water and invasive species and um, other data sets to determine, okay, where were they gonna do, get the most bang for their buck doing mitigation efforts. And as I was helping them develop these tools to make these decisions, it really became clear that these tools were useless if they were always operating in crisis mode. They never had enough money, they couldn't communicate clearly, and so, through that process, I was like, well, you know what, if I'm gonna really make a difference on these sorts of things, these kinds of land management decisions, I need to be in a decision-making position. Um, this was back in 2016. So I said, well, I'll go run for office. And I have to admit, I did not know anything about the process of running for office at the time. Um, just, I'm a learn by doing person though. So I you know, put my name in the ring, felt out the process, learned the ins and outs, um, didn't win. Uh, kind of didn't expect to, but um, the, the thing about this, this uh, process of, of running for office and being involved in politics is you got to be willing to make the effort and keep trying and, you know, pick yourself up and do the work. And so I ran again in 2018 and I lost again <laughs> and it was heartbreaking, but it was much closer um, that time. And then here we are, third time's a charm. Um, and you know, I did switch gears from, from looking at a state seat to a council seat. And a lot of that had to do with over the course of that time where I was campaigning, I was out knocking on doors, really listening and talking to people. It became clear that I could have the most impact, the most direct impact at the county level. And I'm so glad I made that choice. Like I'm feeling in this position here, the actions that I take are, the impact is immediate. 
And some of the key issues that I'm concerned about, like I mentioned before, climate change, land use policy, um, that is, that's the jurisdiction of the county council. And um, so I'm, I'm very happy uh, that I that I was eventually elected to the council. And like I say, I'm very, very grateful every day to um, have this, this position. It's very difficult. I will not say that, it is not easy. It's, being a scientist is easier uh, by a long shot, but it is so worth it. And um, I, I tell people it's the hardest job I'll ever love. Wonderful. Um, on that note, um, do you believe that marginalized communities are well represented in office? And if not, how can we improve this? Um, good question. And, um, you know, I, 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 I want to stress that um, elected office is not the only place to have influence. Um, I do think we need better, more diverse um, representation in elected office in the county and around the state. Um, I think we're doing better than a lot of places, um, certainly with the representation of women, um, representation of Native Hawaiians. Um, you know, we have Miley David, Haleka Anaba, and um, Sue Liloy, who all have Native Hawaiian um, ancestry, you know, part of our, our, our uh, county council. But another really great place to have influence and to serve is on all of the boards and commissions that are both at the county and state level. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I can say, hopefully I, I believe I've had a direct impact on um, talking with the mayor and the, the exec, his um, executive assistant, um, Pomai Bartolome saying, hey, listen, I really wanna see more diverse representation on these boards and commissions. And um, I, we, what we have seen in, in recent weeks is in, in months is um, really a presentation of, of candidates for these boards and commissions that represent diverse communities, you know, folks that are born and raised here, um, people of Native Hawaiian ancestry, people of different socioeconomic statuses. And so, you know, I really think that's great. We're building up that bench um, because often sitting on a, a board or a commission is it's a great stepping stone to a future in um, public office. And so, for example, I sat on the appeals board um, prior to, to running for office, learned a lot of the basics about what's in the jurisdiction of the county, how parliamentary procedure works. Um, and, and so I, I suggest that to anyone that's considering running for political office that are maybe not quite feeling there yet, or people that, that don't wanna run for political office, but wanna have an influence on what's happening in our community. Um, there's a lot of wonderful opportunities on boards and commissions, both at the county and the state level. So more specifically on, on issues facing Native Hawaiians or on Hawaii Island, what do you see as the most press, pressing issues for this? And what are your thoughts on what to do about it? Yeah, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say really two things. <laughs> I'm going to cheat and, and, and give you two answers to that. Um, one of them is housing and uh, DHHL holdings and access to affordable housing on those properties. Um, we know that's been a problem. Um, there is hopefully some funding coming through this legislative cy cycle to, to help build out the infrastructure and build out some of those housing. That, that's kind of a basic one. Um, other one is um, pretty the loss of access to traditional places and places where, that were used for fishing, hunting, gathering, or, or even just you know, being out in the natural environment. And you know, I think this goes back to some really fundamental conflicts between the Western perception of land ownership and the Native Hawaiian traditional perception of kuleana for a place and belonging to a place. And those two ideas are inherently contradictory and we see them butting up against each other a lot. And even more so now, as more and more places become suddenly gated off or um, inaccessible to, to everyone. Um, you know, this, this is a particular problem in my district. You know, we have um, Hamaku, uh, Hakalau Beach Park closed, Kolekole Beach Park closed. 
We have challenges with the Pepecao accesses, even though that they, they are there in um, agreements. And of course, now we have YPO Valley close additionally. So you know, that, that I think is one of the other big challenges. Um, if I can cheat a little more and take a third, <laughs> I would also say that our native Hawaiian communities have definitely suffered from um, environmental justice issues. So if you look at Keokaha, for example, that is where the airport is and the wastewater treatment plant is and the sewer, the, the um, natural gas storage location, you know, there definitely has been an abuse of the community from the standpoint of environmental justice and co-locating things that we know are hazardous, both to human health and safety and to the environment in Native Hawaiian communities. So those are the three things. I, I, I know you only asked for one, but I, I, uh, I think all of those are equally important. Just to follow up on the last um, point with the environmental justice issue of this infrastructure, what as like a county council member or just a leader can, are you able to do um, to combat this um, continuing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, if you take Keokaha as an example, um, you know, there are things that are within the county jurisdiction like wastewater. Um, and, and that's certainly something I've been a, a, an advocate for and have been working aggressively on with our Department of Environmental Management as well as, as folks at the state level um, to try to improve uh, the Gila wastewater treatment facility so we don't have so much contamination going out into the bay there. That is, that is certainly at the, the county level's jurisdiction. Um, you know, other things in terms of uh, the, the um, the solid waste facility and how that is maintained and what sort of um, mitigation measures we we put forth in the future now that that is going that that site is closed you know how how can we off gas some of the, the hydrogen that's being produced there how can we deal with the seepage it's an unlined landfill um, so that there, there is a lot within the the county's jurisdiction the stuff regarding the airports and the fuel storage and the the port, you know, that that is state jurisdiction, but I tend to not, try to not in my position um, say that's not my responsibility um, because I know how <laughs> you're smiling. That is so frustrating. If you are a constituent and you call somebody and you don't know who to call, so you start with the person that you know most, or you run to them in the grocery store and say, I've got this problem with X. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than having your representative say, well, that's not really my jurisdiction. I can't help you. Um, I really try to avoid that. And, and even when it is not within the county's jurisdiction, I either try to connect folks with people at the state or the federal level who can help or, you know, start trying to facilitate a process. Um, just because it legally isn't within my jurisdiction as a legislature um, doesn't mean it's not within my kuleana as a human being to help try to um, solve these challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know some groups have approached a private public partnership to address these waste issues, um, mm -hmm. both water and, and solid waste as well. But how, what do you think about this approach? Yeah, I think there's opportunity there. Um, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of advancement in the wastewater arena, if you will. I, I didn't know a whole lot of about wastewater. Um, before I came into the council, now I'm like really well <laughs> versed in this field. Um, there, and, and I'd love to call it, rather than talking about wastewater, I like to talk about resource recovery because what you see with, with the wastewater dialogue is a huge discussion about how we shift from just managing sewage to saying we're, this is a valuable resource and we're gonna claim those materials for either water or for solids that can be used for all sorts of things. And um, you know the the uh, concern about public-private partnerships is privatizing functions that are typically performed by civil servants and and those folks you know belong to the unions. And so you know I think it's really important. Um, I'm a strong union supporter because I support for fair wages, living wages. Um, you know it's important to preserve those positions, those jobs where we're looking at modernization projects or new uh, functions for these wastewater facilities, 
Um, I think that public private partnerships can help us with the development and then the ongoing maintenance and operations. That's when we can go back and we can actually have those full service positions come in and run those facilities. The truth is we are so far behind on um, wastewater management. Um, our, our, our Department of Environmental Management has said a couple of billion dollars, right, to get us to the primo spot where we need to be. Um, that's a lot of money for us to try to come up with on our own. And so there are um, organizations out there that work with municipalities that help them develop um, all sorts of, of different scales of, of resource rec reclamation with re respect to wastewater that you know, I think we could partner with and, and come up with some good solutions without violating the spirit of um, the Kono decision and um, you know, the protection of, of civil service employment. Awesome. This is a bit more of a broad question. Um, what does Hawaiian sovereignty mean to you? Hmm. Well, I mean, at the very bare minimum, it means a, a self-rule, right? It, it means a sovereignty of um, a nation of, of people. Um, what it means in practical, practical terms, sorry, there's an airplane going over right now. Okay. <laughs> um, I can't even hear myself. Um, in, in practical terms, I have to admit, I don't know. I, I don't know what that might look like. I mean, there are different um, models of, out there. Um, it, I, I, so I, I, I don't know in practical terms what I look like, but, it, but in the, what it looks like, but in theory, you know, it's, it's a form of self-rule. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, climate change mitigation adaptation, mm -hmm. 2030, did that year hold any significance to you, considering um, that by 2030 we have to reduce by 50% of greenhouse emissions globally, and that holds so much so much weight for us. So I'm just wondering if any of your goals, ideas align with that year per se. Yeah, well, let's see. By 2030, I won't be in office at county council anymore. I'll also be kind of old. I turned 50 this year. Um, so that. <laughs> Kind of a daunting, daunting idea. I'll be fifty-eight, um, but but you know seriously, um, you know we have a lot of climate change adaptation and mitigation goals that are centered around 2030, uh, 2035, 2045. Whether we're looking at conversion of, of county fleets, reduction of um, uh, fossil fuel usage, uh, energy efficiency, and and uh, reliance on renewables. Um, my my concern is that that goal, I mean, it, it is only eight years, my goodness, but it, it is still farther out. And we know that government has, one, it works really slow, and two, it's difficult to bring that sense of urgency to do something when the goal, when the deadline feels so far out. I mean, it's going to be here before we know it, but right now, still, it feels so far out. And so um, you'll be talking with council member Viegas after this, but she and I have just engaged in a process in developing a climate change chapter for the Hawaii County Code. We actually do not have a chapter that sits behind the committee that she is chair of and I am vice chair of. Um, and so that's what we're working on developing. And, and a key part of that is one, defining what is climate change, what is climate change adaptation, what is mitigation? What's sustainability? What is resilience? Because these are all terms that get thrown around a lot. And if you don't agree on the meaning, the approach to achieving those things can be very, very different. The other thing that it's going to contain, um, we hope, is a series of intermediate benchmarks. So rather than just by 2030, we're going to get to this. By 2045, we're going to get to this. We want so many intermediate stages so that there are more manageable incremental targets so that we don't end up just blowing it off because there's not that that sense of urgency. Um, the other key thing that I that I'm excited about having in this chapter is um, methodology for calculating metrics um, around climate change. There are very different ways to calculate greenhouse gas emissions for uh, for example associated with certain things. Um, if you use the, the IPCCC, the United Nations mechanism for counting greenhouse gases, a tomato 
produced in Hawaii is going to have more Hawaii carbon associated with it than a tomato imported from California. And that is because we attribute all the carbon to where the thing was created. And so if you use that metric, if you use that system for measuring carbon, what are you disincentivizing? You're disincentivizing local food production just because of the way you calculated carbon emissions. And so one of the things that this chapter will really um, suss out is what metrics are we gonna use? What methodology so that we're not inadvertently disincentivizing things that we actually care about? Um, in, in addition to that, there will also be a series of benchmarks and reporting that we're gonna require within the county to kind of assess in a real way, how close are we to achieving these various intermediate goals, getting us there to that far goal of 2030 and beyond. So exciting, lots of good things going on there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thanks for sharing. Oops, uh, Claire, you're muted. Thanks. Um, in terms of other um, things that you've been working on during your first session, are there other um, other items that you're really excited about? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had uh, introduced in February the electric vehicle charging infrastructure bill um, that was passed out of committee and is now re being reviewed by the planning commissions because it's a change to the zoning code. So that would require um, all new parking facilities to um, with 50 stalls or more to have at least one dual head charging station um, by, tw by uh, 2025. And then we actually step that up. So every two years, the number of chargers required goes up. And so again, thinking about really advancing and not just setting one level, but really creating these incremental advancements. And with all of the money that the federal government is putting into EV charging infrastructure, it's just the prime time to be um, doing something like that. Um, in addition to that, I have a couple of pieces of legislation that I'm working on that have to do with um, agricultural exemptions and dedications for property taxes. Um, I think I've spoken to you folks before about one of the reasons that um, housing is so unaffordable and land is so unaffordable in Hawaii County is because it's a very safe place to speculate on land. And a lot of good agricultural land gets sucked up. People take these agricultural exemptions and they're not actually producing anything. They're not actually farming. They're not actually contributing to the food systems. And so the idea of this legislation is not in any way to penalize people who are legitimately doing agriculture legitimately producing food for the community, but to, to reduce that level of speculation so that more of that land becomes available for local people to do farming or, or to provide housing opportunities. Um, so that is, those have been drafted and I'm currently farming them out, no pun intended, I'm farming them out to the agricultural community because the last thing I want to do is accidentally, you know, leave out anybody that's legitimately contributing and, and legitimately taking those, those tax breaks. So well, that, that's at that stage. Um, also, so this is all related to housing. Um, so in addition to those tax policies, looking at short-term vacation rentals, which is another mechanism by which housing is taken out of the rent, long-term rental market, um, shoring up some of those uh, guidelines based a lot on what they're doing right now in City and County of Honolulu. Um, we have some major gaps in our, our short-term vacation rental policy. So that has, that has also been drafted. I think it's in about its fifth revision right now, going back and forth with the planning department on that one to make sure we can introduce something that's workable. Um, we also have just introduced um, Council Member Inaba and I, um, an affordable housing um, charter amendment to dedicate 1% of property taxes to a revolving affordable housing fund, um, which will go to the Office of Housing and Community Development to obviously build more affordable housing. But we've paired that with a bill that creates a whole suite of options um, for the housing office to use those funds um, outside of the, the typical ways that they've used them, looking at some models in other places that have worked to generate more affordable housing um, we're hoping that the, by, by bringing those sustained funds into the Office of Housing, providing a lot of different mechanisms for them to use, the, um, use those funds and leverage those funds, um, we can really accelerate the development of affordable housing um, in, 
in the community. Um, Haleka and I have also worked on some revisions to chapter 11, which is our affordable housing chapter, but that's kind of stalled for right now until um, our Office of Housing finishes um, a study on um, various things that will actually feed into our legislation. So I think it's, you know, it's a good thing that they're they're taking the time um, to do that analysis and then we can tie it into the, the legislation we've been working on. Um, there's a few other things that are not legislative. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to take up too much time on this question, but there are also a lot of projects. So I would say that just in general, my, my role as a council person is, I, is I, I call, there's like three parts. There's community organizing, facilitating, there's legislation, and then there's projects. And so I have a few different projects about um, shoreline access, um, Honoka'a and um, corridor planning for the, the Honoka'a YPO road. YPO destination management is a big project um, that is underway right now outside of the immediate closure. Um, yeah, Could lots of things going on. <laughs> about the YPO um, access and closure issue. Yeah, so um, the uh, the mayor issued an executive order um, last month to close the road based on the findings of a geotechnical study, um, which you know indicated that the the road was was dangerous. We kind of all knew it was like it. <laughs> I don't know if you folks have ever been down there, but it's sketchy. Um, and, and it, there was a, a landslide in, in 2019, which I think um, undermined the stability of the road even more. And so the road has been closed temporarily under this emergency order so that the consultants can come back in and do further analysis and to determine you know, where are the really unsafe areas, what can we do to mitigate it? Um, and so that's kind of the immediate issue is that safety of the road. Um, we had actually begun prior to this emergency closure, a destination management process for just controlling access, visitor access to the valley. Um, it it's, was a huge concern um, prior to COVID. Uh, you know, there were days where 500 cars would go down there. I mean, the valley was never designed, that road, the valley, was never designed for that kind of love. I mean, it's it's being loved to death. And so um, this process where we are right now is in that we're, we have a, a steering committee um, that has begun to meet, have conversations um, about what sort of options we might have as far as controlling access and and really managing the, the location to the everyone's best interest, you know, to the land's interest, to the residents' interest, to the visitors' interest, to the local community. From the current steering committee efforts, um, we will be engaging in, there are four community meetings. Um, the first ones are coming up in May, um, where the community at large will be able to um, share information. So these, these are, I shouldn't call them community meetings. I, they're, they're more of information exchanges to try to make this a really collaborative process. Um, if you guys are familiar with how they manage um, Hanauma Bay on Oahu or um, Haina on Kauai, this is the same sort of engagement, community engagement process that resulted in you know some fairly successful and reasonable ways to manage these places that. Um, we just that, that experience over tourism, and I'm hoping that with really a concerted effort, the hard work of this the steering committee, um, what happens in YPO will become a model for other places on our island that are are experiencing, you know, a, a greater visitor pressure than they were designed or or should experience. Mm -hmm. That's great, because actually, uh, my next question was about tourism. So you already started talking about that. But what are other initiatives that you have more specifically for tourism um, to ensure that the industry is in, is in service of the working communities on island instead of the other way around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like I said, I think the, the YPO model, um, if, if I can take this opportunity then to kind of mm -hmm. go into a little more depth about mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I think what we're looking at there is really removing the 
expletive nature of, of the visitor experience, right? Rather than just coming and taking, they're coming and they're contributing in some way, whether it's through volunteerism, whether it's through a financial contribution because they get to take a shuttle ride out to the valley or they get to see a video about the valley and the history. Um, you know, in some way, a more there's a little bit more reciprocity with the local community and the environment with the visitor experience. And, um, you know, we, we are so reliant on, on tourism. So I think, you know, part of this is also looking at ways to diversify our economy beyond just tourism. And it, I caution people, you know, you, a lot of times when they say, oh, let, you know, let's, let's produce this, this uh, agricultural product or that agricultural product in kind of reverting us back to the old plantation days, I don't think we successfully go back there. I don't think there's a model where that actually works out well for us. Um, if we want to diversify our economy, we've really got to be leapfrogging ahead into other potential areas that are not so damaging, both to our communities, but also to our environment. So, you know, looking at how we, um, we address the, the impacts of tourism, you know, it's, it's a combination of changing the experience, changing the level of our economy that is based on that alone. And then also, um, if I may say, just, just changing who comes. <laughs> and, and, and that may be an unpopular opinion, but let me just say, there is no requirement to democratize the visitor industry. It is, it is a luxury and it is a privilege and it's not necessary for us to make it possible for everyone to do it. And, and uh, that may seem harsh, but I think we need to be in, in there. There are subtle mechanisms to do this, right? To be careful about basically who is invited into our space. We want to ensure that the people who are invited in are the people that are not going to leave their stuff all around and trash our home and you know, leave the place a mess. We want people that are gonna come and be nice to have, and maybe they're good for conversation and maybe we learn a little something from them, but you wouldn't wanna invite anybody into your home. And, and we don't need to invite just anybody into Hawaii County. What are some of those, a few examples of those mechanisms? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah, no, I think, um, well, you know, we, we have talked before about how when you look at these sort of surface level actions, you need to walk it back to the fundamental structures that enable certain actions or prevent certain actions. So when we look at what's within the county's jurisdiction, it's about land use, it's about taxes, it's about um, transportation options, and um, it's about permissible, permissible uses of, of different areas. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that we utilize to um, to to uh, address the these these more surface level outcomes. And so, for example, short term vacation rentals. You know that that has opened up a market to, in some cases, visitors that are are like I said, not quite the type we want. <laughs> um, and so, ensuring a little bit more structure around short-term vacation rentals and, and how that works will hopefully result in the outcome that we have a more thoughtful um, visitor presence. Thank you for going in depth into that. That's a, definitely an issue I think that's come up a lot, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and our issues with understanding now that economic development is something that we need to be focusing on um, outside of yeah. tourism, what areas would you, um, or are you hoping to focus on with economic development? Yeah, you know, I think um, I would really like to see the advancement of, of UH Hilo and the programs that are offered through the university, um, particularly because we could be we should be world-class in a few areas of study, particularly volcanology, of course, um, but also marine science. And then probably, you know, right up my, my ballywack is, is climate change. I mean, we have 
in our environment here a natural temperature gradient, a natural rainfall gradient. So all of those sorts of analyses that you would like to do about what, how changing temperatures or how changing water levels impact ecosystems, we can do that here um, because we, we have basically the perfect laboratory, if you will, for that, that sort of work. So I, I see us having the potential to really lead on issues related to climate change adaptation and mitigation. And that includes, you know, all of the, the, the things that have been done in Hawaii uh, around renewable energy. Um, the other area I think um, that we could be taking advantage of more is um, sort of the, the, the tech entrepreneurial um, space. I think it's um, area that, you know, there's a lot of creativity and innovation happening here in Hawaii. Um, you know, we, we developed the, the app that you could use to, to track COVID cases around you that, I mean, that was developed here and not, not in, in Hawaii, the state. And um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space and it's, it's a low impact. Um, it's in, in terms of environmental impact um, and it's, it's potentially high income. Um, I think what is, Challenging is, is the workforce development piece of that. Um, and I, there, there's um, some efforts that I've been involved in to really look at changing the, the training programs out there um, to encourage more participation in that, that space, um, that, that innovator space. As we know also, so much of this is rooted in our youth. Um, how can we, indulge our youth in wanting to get into these sectors and how can we adjust our school system or public school systems to work with that and towards that? Yeah, you know, I, I think we're seeing that already. Um, in some cases, you know, there are a number of innovative programs at, at our various schools around this, this island. And, and what I love most are, are some of the programs that I've seen out there that, that actually integrate sustainability questions or reef protection and climate change. And then this tech science -y side, like um, they're, they're really taking those two parts. And, and so there are different robotics programs and um, um, computer software programs that, that students are already engaged in. I think what we need to, to to focus on is what I, what I hear a lot, and I, you know, is from the younger folks is they don't see a future where they're here. They don't see a future where they can find a job here. They don't find see a future where they can afford a home here. And so, I think is as leaders, as community leaders, what what we need to create is that model, that vision that says there is a place for you here. There is a way for you to stay here and keep doing this important work and contribute back to the community. So, I mean, I know that's kind of pie in the sky, but I think if, if there was something I, I would focus on, it's, it's generating these, these models of, of the possibility, right? The, and, and generating that excitement and hope that, that there's a, a, a reliable future here where you can have a sustainable you know, quality of life and you can have a family and you can have a home and um, you know, live out your dreams. Okay. One, one for one more question. Go ahead. Oh, good. Yes, I was about that. That went fast. <laughs> that went really fast. <laughs> well, I think the only topic we haven't touched in is uh, marine marine management and conservation specifically. Wondering if you have an initiative or if you're leaning towards um, supporting local nonprofits that are have programs already in support of, you know, clean debris from the ocean or coral coral health management, or are you more inclined to um, managing specific industries like the commercial aquarium trade and and attacking it that way? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um my involvement in protection of near shore waters at, at this time and our, our reef systems um, really has to do with wastewater management. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's so much we need to do there all around the island. So, you know, looking at the, the, the building of, of more wastewater facilities, connection of more households and businesses to those facilities, um, you know, we have the most, um, 
cesspools of any of the islands, some 50,000 that will need to be converted by 2045. Um, those are th those in the shoreline areas are, are having a pretty sin significant impact on the quality and health of, uh, of our near shore reef areas. So, you know, we need to advance the conversion of those either to other systems or connecting them to, to wastewater systems. Um, you know, I mentioned before that resource reclamation. So moving us away from the injection well model to models where we actually take that water and we try to recover it and reuse it. Um, so there's a lot to be done. I think probably the most if I were to, to focus on a specific initiative that in, in addition to, to looking at the wastewater funding and the wastewater models um, for the larger scale wastewater treatment plant, there is funding through the Department of Health um, revolving funds for cesspool conversion um, to support lower income families to be able to do that conversion. And right now the program is not really workable for the counties. So I have been um, conversing with Kauai County um, and the Department of Health to figure out, okay, how do we make this a program that we can actually utilize? So there's 1.2 million in that revolving fund right now that the counties could take advantage of to help lower and moderate income families do that conversion. Um, but it, the, the program needs work <laughs> to make it something that the county can actually take advantage of. And one of the things that we're considering tying that into is um, going back to the housing issue is if we allow for accessory dwelling units or, or more density on already developed lot, lots, one of the things we could, could use to do to incentivize affordable housing is, is say, we'll help provide funding to do your cesspool conversion so that you can get on a septic tank, develop your accessory dwelling unit, but then you have to make it affordable as a rental for a certain period of time or something like that. So that that's kind of another thing that's that's in the works on that um, wastewater angle. Yeah. Oh, thank you for doing that. Wastewater management is mm -hmm. such a big um, it's huge. issue it's in daunting. marine management, <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's the end of our interview tonight. Thank you, uh, Heather Kimball of District One for joining us this evening and sharing with us um, all of the efforts that you're working on and pushing forward for our Hawaii Island community. And thank you to both of our interviewers, Claire and Dami. Great job, I really appreciate you both taking the time to participate in this interview. Um, at Huli Pak, we're building something that we believe the political establishment has never seen before, a slate of Pono candidates. Your donation to this cause can help with our transformation of the Hawaii Island political system. So if you're able, we ask please that you can go onto our website at hulihai.com to make a donation whenever you're able. Um, thank you, everyone.